Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out on this beautiful Thursday evening um, to listen to a nerd talk about comics. Um, uh, uh, I am, as was mentioned, this is what I'm best known for, um, not least because it took me a very long time to make. <laughs> uh, it's weird how that's become kind of a marketing point for my book. Um, it must be good because it took him so long. Um, I hope it's good. Uh, people seem to like it. Uh, coincidentally, um, this other book that I wrote, I didn't draw this book, Houdini the Handcuff King, but um, I wrote it and it was originally published, I think 12 years ago. And is that right? I'm getting a nod. Somebody knows this book. Ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it just got reprinted and is um, uh, in bookstores again. So if you're curious at all about Houdini, it's more of a young adult book and it just is about one day in the life of Harry Houdini, the great escape artist. Um, but the main thing I've been going around talking about is um, this other thing I did, um, which is the story of Berlin, Germany, um, uh, between the wars, specifically this particular story that I chose to tell starts in 1928 and ends for the characters and ends in 1933. Um, goes a little bit beyond that, spoiler, um, but it spans about five years of the city. And it primarily centers around um, uh, Kurt Severing, who's a journalist, this guy right here, and Martha Muller, who's a, um, an art student. Kurt has lived in Berlin for many years, and um, Marta, the book starts with Marta arriving for the first time. So she's the kind of, uh, and the kind of young person experiencing urban life for the first time. So using those two characters as a starting point, I kind of follow them into the city and to see what I can find. <clears throat> From very early on, uh, I made it uh, a goal to sort of show as much of the spectrum of society as possible. I wanted to show people from all walks of life. I wanted to explore um, what the city and this particular period in history meant to them and how it affected them. So it's everything from um, basically people living on the street to uh, aristocrats, um, uh, characters of all different stripes kind of show up in the course of the story. And you can't really tell a story that takes place in this time period without touching at least a little bit on World War I, which was, um, of course, uh, an unprecedented um, period in human civilization where uh, warfare was basically industrialized. You know, if you think about the idea of the machine gun and how many people could be killed in a single minute by something like that. Um, the World War I um, writ that horror large and it had a tremendous uh, and profound effect on everybody that survived it. <clears throat> and um, occasionally there's a flashback to that in my story. Uh, so I had to touch on World War I a little bit. Uh, I also um, was compelled to think about the experience of um, uh, Jews who were living in Berlin at the time and the process of um, assimilation or, or coexistence over a number of years and how um, that was dealt with. So this is uh, the Schwartz family and David Schwartz, the sort of in those four panels on the right there, the leftmost figure is David Schwartz. He's the, the only son of the family and he, um, <clears throat> part of the story involves him trying to cope with basically being a young man growing up in this culture that um, hates him, essentially. Uh, which leads me into the politics of the time. Uh, there were 32 different political parties in the Reichstag, if you can imagine that. Um, there was a political party for every little demographic subdivision of the country. Um, and many of those, especially the more powerful ones, um, had actual uh, arms of sort of pseudo militia who would fight out their ideologies physically on the street. So you get actual street brawls between different political parties. Um, in this case, there's uh, uh, some communists are, are sort of staging an impromptu protest and the police are trying to clamp down on that. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of this uh, street level uh, tension uh, rose to a head in 1929. Um, at the May Day demonstration, which came to be known as Bloody May, because the communists, um, in defiance of a city ban against demonstration, held um, their traditional May Day, May Day march, and it ended um, horribly with a number of people being shot and killed by the Berlin police 
Um, a lot of historians point to this as one of the, you know, there was, of course, a series of different events that kind of led things the way that they ended up going, but um, the Bloody May was um, a really big one, so that becomes an important part of my story. And it's the closing, it's a three-part story, all three parts are in here, and the end of part one ends with this demonstration. You also can't have a story about Berlin without touching on the nightlife. Um, in terms of arts, uh, the arts, um, music, and, um, and theater, and modern dance, um, incredible. Berlin was in a lot of ways, it was second only to Paris in terms of being kind of cultural capital of Europe. Uh, there were, uh, it was at the forefront of, of, you know, all the different areas that you might define as um, of human progress and the arts was no exception. A lot of um, the film that was created during this period um, were still kind of, uh, is still present in film that we see today. Um, a lot of the techniques that were developed um, coming out of and related to German expressionism, among other things. But nightlife and the world of the arts is an important part of life then, so it becomes a part of my story as well. Uh, for better or for worse, I'm known as in comics as the guy who draws buildings. Um, because I do draw a lot of buildings. I don't necessarily enjoy drawing buildings. It is satisfying to finish a drawing of a building, but the process of the drawing itself is very laborious and tedious. But uh, I made a choice very early on to commit to believable architecture um, because I wanted the reader to sort of imagine that this was a real place. I mean, obviously Berlin, Germany is a real place, but this was my little fictional version of it, and I wanted it to have a kind of physical coherence that would convince the reader that these, these characters, these fictional characters were somehow real. So that meant creating believable environments. <clears throat> um, every scene in my book takes place in a specific place in the city. I had a big map of the city on my wall, and as much as possible, I found specific photo reference for buildings for a particular area, like this specific train station that this character would have gone to to travel to a different specific part of town. Um, so that's just a quick overview of my book. Um, the rest of my talk is going to be split between a crackpot theory I have about comics itself, um, and then a little bit about my background and how I ended up um, coming to write this, um, this crazy thing does feel kind of crazy. So my thesis is this. <laughs> Words are pictures. I don't know, how many of you knew that already? Anyone, anyone? All right, good, excellent. Some people, some people are clued in to that. Um, does anyone recognize this? Does anyone, does this look familiar at all? Any ideas? That is a handprint, in fact, yes. Well, not a handprint, right? It's not an actual print of a hand. It's um, somebody put their hand on a wall and uh, of a cave specifically. Um, this particular handprint dates to 30,000 years ago, if you can believe that, which is nuts. Um, it was found on um, a cave in uh, uh, Chauvet Pont d'Arc in France. It's a cave system in Southern France. To get to this cave, you walk up this road and then you climb up this ledge and then um, you crawl, you have to crawl through a little crevice right about there to get in there. Um, what's incredible about this print um, to me, not only that it's 30,000 years old, but that it's a, the handprint of a human who lived 30,000 years ago, right? It's their actual mark on the wall. Um, and then when you think about why someone chose to do this, that's also really interesting to me. What they've been able to figure out is that the red is some kind of possibly um, um, berry juice or pigment derived from earth blown through maybe a reed, like mixed with water and blown through a reed like an airbrush, um, to create that, um, that uh, silhouette of the hand. Um, and I just love thinking about like why did somebody choose to do that, right? Other than to say I was here, right? It's a kind of signature. Somebody's specific hand was put on that wall. And we can only imagine the reasons why, but I love that somebody chose to do it in that same cave, so that's, let's see, that's where Chauvet is. And just to give you some context for this, so that was 30,000 years ago. This is a simplified map of early human migration, um, which shows you roughly uh, where uh, we originated. All um, genetic evidence points to this region, and then you can see uh, how long ago humans ended up in these different um, spots. Um, here's, a kind of, here's an example of the kind of art that covers the walls elsewhere in that cave. 
same cave, um, starting between 30 to 32,000 years ago. And periodically, over the course of the following 10,000 years, people would go into this cave and make marks on the wall, which is astonishing to me. Um, these kinds of marks, right? Details of big cats. Um, what is incredible about this from the perspective of somebody like me who teaches art um, is how good these drawings are. Um, that our ability as artists has not really progressed past our capacity 30,000 years ago. The technology has advanced. We can do more complicated things now, but the, the ability to conceive of and reproduce something that we've seen um, is ast it's astonishingly sophisticated here. When you look at these drawings in real life in 3D, looking at the cave wall, you can see that the artists actually looked we're, we're drawing shapes out of stuff that was already on the wall, right? There'd be like a place where the wall kind of bulged out or a crack, and they would take advantage of that the same way that you might imagine um, a cloud looks like, you know, a dragon or whatever. And they, you can see the physical three-dimensionality of the cave wall being taken advantage of to create these, these drawings. And here, drawn over and over and over again. Um, the entrance to this cave, so in all likelihood, no animals ever came into this cave. Possibly they might have come in dead um, or to be, you know, to be cooked and eaten. But most of the drawings in here were drawn, um, they had to be drawn by firelight because it's of course pitch black in there. And they were probably drawn from memory. So people would go into this cave and remember things that they had seen and reproduce them on the wall. Um, not too far from there is um, the caves at Lascaux, France, where another set of cave drawings were discovered. Um, what's incredible now, they believe, because of other evidence that has been um, unearthed, is that these caves are covered with drawings and paintings. But it, now the current thinking is, the, in fact, above ground, every possible surface was also covered with drawings and paintings. We think of these as being isolated and put away somewhere, but in fact, people drew everywhere <laughs> on all kinds of things, trees and rocks and um, wherever they could find a surface to make marks. So this urge that humans have had before written language existed to make marks on things, to reproduce parts of the natural world, um, goes, goes way far back. This isn't as far back, nine to 12,000 years, but here we've got color happening as this um, uh, horse or equivalent animal is being drawn. What's, what I love about this is those two marks off of its back, those are actual marks and people hypothesize that it might be darts or arrows that perhaps the artist is imagining or remembering a hunt where this creature was um, hunted down and killed. Also, um, the artist is figuring out um, how to draw things on basically a two-dimensional surface and convey the idea of depth, right? This hind leg here, having it not touch right there gives, adds to this impression of it being somehow further away. The same with that front leg. This is like common stuff that we do in cartooning all the time. Um, here's a painting of an aurochs from the same cave complex. An aurochs is an um, extinct type of wild cattle that inhabited that part of the world between 12 and 13,000 years ago. Um, the last recorded aurochs died in Poland in 1627. Um, and for the purposes of this crackpot theory that I have, the aurochs is our mascot. I'm happy about it. So <laughs> mark making. Um, people have been making marks, I think, probably since as long as they could figure out how to make a mark, <laughs> right? A lightning bolt strikes a tree. There's a branch on the ground that burns you know, down to ash. You pick it up and it makes a nice rich black mark on your friend <laughs> or a rock. And that's an incredibly um, exciting thing, right? Making marks. Um, and what we've done with those marks <clears throat> is um, pretty interesting to me over the course of, of millennia. And uh, I like to think of mark making as evolving in um, uh, two different directions, like all categorical thinking, of course, it's a gray area, but for the purposes of this, I'm gonna talk about two different directions. In one direction, we have the representational, where our aurochs over the millennia um, is adapted to different cultures and um, different techniques and different technology, different art making technology is created, which allows things like color drawings, more subtle coloration. This is from um, the Tang Dynasty in China. Um, this, our cow basically evolves over the, um, over the years 
to be drawn in a number of different ways. Once reproducible um, artwork starts the advent of um, printing and you have things like woodcuts um, where an artist can cut a single wood block and then that wood block can be printed multiple times um, at the sort of dawn of publishing. Um, that technology had certain limitations where you could only use these relatively heavy marks to communicate something. But even so, you can see that this artist um, is not only using those marks to try to convey the volume of the animal, but trying to capture something as ephemeral as clouds. So the idea of um, using something as kind of um, kind of crude and coarse as a cut in a block of wood to capture something as ephemeral as clouds um, is totally interesting to me. And maybe only to me, but you're here, so. <laughs> uh, later engraving allows much finer detail, so every hair on our mascot can become visible and reproduced. Um, this is from uh, Brehm's Animal Life, which is a reference book published in the mid-19th century. And then um, somebody like Vincent van Gogh um, we use the actual kind of um, physical qualities of oil paint to build it up dimensionally on the surface of a canvas, canvas and th in doing that, you know, even sort of calling back to those cave paintings, create a feeling of three-dimensional, um, you know, tr trying to bring the life out of the observed uh, into this uh, static painting. So the technology has evolved, but our capacity as artists, our skill has really not. And I can tell you from having taught art students now for um, over 13 years. Um, the sophistication, they bring a, a kind of sophistication and awareness of the meaning of their marks, but their ability as artists has not gotten any further than this. <laughs> and that's fine, because this is amazing. Um, and of course, the sort of, the kind of uh, ultimate uh, uh, technological ability um, was the invention of the photograph, which um, for a lot of realist painters kind of ruined their whole careers because it basically said, hey, we don't need to paint or draw it anymore. We can just take a picture and um, you can remember that. Um, and then, of course, from here we have everything. We have uh, three-dimensional animation and CGI that you see in movies everywhere where every hair on that cow can be reproduced, you know, in a digital space. So that's where the technology has taken us in this attempt to represent the world, right? You observe a thing like an animal and you represent it somehow. The other direction that mark making evolved was toward abstraction. Um, our same animal, at a certain point in um, the history of marks that were capturing this animal, was turned into this. If you can see the head of that animal transposed on that, you can see that this is meant to represent, um, I mean, out of context, you can't see that, of course, but this is meant to represent the head of a, of, a, of a herd, of a, of a member of a herd of cattle. Three simple marks, right? Um, and it captures the, the horns, the head, and the ears of, of this animal. Um, so at this point um, in the evolution of abstract mark making, starting with the animal, um, no longer is it a specific animal, it's an abstraction of an animal, right? You can't identify this is not Bessie the cow that you have, you know, in your, in your back 40. This is just the idea of a cow. Um, we call this also an ideogram because it represents the sort of general concept of a cow. Um, this is a, my attempt at, in Photoshop to do a, 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 a facsimile of a clay tablet where somebody would be counting cows because, well, one of the ways this symbol was used was um, as an accounting notation to keep track of how many animals were in a particular herd or that you owned, and then you would go to market and you would trade it with other people. And um, so if you have your mark-making tool in your clay tablet, you could go boom, 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 three quick marks, and you could uh, make... The, he the head of a cow, and then you could use that to count how many you had. So here we have our basic ideogram for aurochs, as employed in Canaan about 3,000 years ago. Around 2,500 years ago, um, it got adopted by the Phoenicians and turned on its side. The Phoenicians, of course, um, largely a merchant people who uh, plied the Mediterranean, traveling from um, culture to culture, right? These, these different cultures grew up very disparately and um, uh, depending on um, the specifics of their native terrain and natural resources, 
uh, and other influences were very, very distinct and separate. And what the Phoenicians did was they traveled from one to the next, um, you know, buying things in one place and selling them somewhere else. And they would, um, so they created this kind of cycle of trade all around the Mediterranean. And in so doing, um, allowed some cultural commerce between those, those different places. Um, and one of the things the Phoenicians did was they borrowed ideograms from different cultures to build their own um, alphabet. Um, so here, that first letter there you can see is our ox, picked up in Canaan um, in the Sinai Peninsula and integrated into the Phoenician alphabet, where it evolved into the letter Aleph, which at this point is a phonogram, by which I mean it represents a sound. It no longer represents an animal. Once it got turned on its side, it became a sound. And then, of course, when you combine these different marks together, you get um, phonetic language. And then over time, it passed through the hands of the Greeks. And then finally, the Romans turned it into the letter that we know today. So in this case, um, this letter is a picture. It was a picture. And it went from being representational to abstract to, um, to represent just a sound. These are other examples of some Phoenician letters there. And you can see how they evolved. I like man's head. That's a great little drawing of a man's head. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have these two divergent paths. And of course, between any two things that you think of as separate, there's always something else. And for me, between the representation line and the abstract, we have the medium of comics, um, which is where I work and where my students work. I call myself a cartoonist. Um, comics is a weird word because it implies humor, right? Comic. Um, uh, but over the years, uh, in my corner of the world, it has come just to mean the medium of words and pictures used in combination. Taking those two things, putting them together. And when you take those two things, when you take a picture, obviously a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. You can look at this picture and it might provoke any number of um, thoughts or ideas in your head. As soon as you attach a word to it, it has a different inflection and a different feeling, right? And for me, when that word and that, the word, the abstraction, combined with that picture, representational, your brain tries to find a connection between those two things because we do that. We seek connection, we seek pattern. Um, and a kind of third thing happens between those two things. And that's where comics kind of operates. Um, and that picture can have a different connotation depending on what word you put next to it. It can seem like wishing upon a thousand stars or it can seem apocalyptic. Um, I like to think of comics as having kind of a patron spirit or force that presides over the medium, uh, demonstrating that the wall between, the imagined wall between the word and the picture is not impermeable. Um, and this force is personified, has been personified in the folklore of um, different cultures all over the world um, for as long probably as those cave paintings have existed. In many traditions, um, this figure acts as a messenger bearing news between the realms of the gods and men, um, showing that by the crossing of those boundaries, uh, those places are not as far apart as people think they are, usually. Um, in Yoruba culture in Africa, um, this figure is called Ishu, the lord of the crossroads. Um, he's blamed for all of the troubles of humans and serves as a mediator between the people and the gods, just like Mercury did. He enjoys tricking people into upsetting the gods and then aiding the gods in their vengeance upon the people. Among indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest, this figure is called Raven or Coyote. One Haida story tells how the world was in total darkness before Raven stole the sun. You can see the sun in Raven's mouth there. Stole the sun from an old man and brought light into the world for the first time. Of course, the story of Prometheus is similar. Um, what's fascinating when you start getting into these different um, uh, uh, sort of myths and folklore is how many of these stories all over the world, apparently evolving independently, have many of the um, precisely same elements to them. So the idea of a fire thief is common also in, um, anybody seen Moana? I saw a smile back there. <laughs> Some of the younger crowd may have seen this film, this Disney film Moana, which is um, in part based on, um, or has takes one of his characters, the uh, Pacific Islander god Maui. Um, Oh, Disney, of course, has watered down and made suitable for family consumption, um, this um, god. And uh, one of the things Maui does is steals fire from some birds and brings it back to his own people. 
Other stories tell of how this figure steals from the rich and gives to the poor. Um, so the trickster is somebody who crosses boundaries and shows people that you think you have all the money? I'm going to take that money and give it to somebody else, right? The trickster kind of tries to poke holes in this idea that there are definite um, boundaries. One um, real-life trickster uh, who existed um, was the artist Mar Marcel Duchamp. He had a studio on the Rue Larie in Paris, um, and in the corner of that studio, there were two, if you picture the corner of a room, there was a doorway here and a doorway here, and they shared the same um, door jam. Throughout his work, he was always interested in um, poking holes in, the, in, in any kind of definite ideas that people had. Oh, I lost my cursor for some reason. Um, let's see if I can remember this. Oh, there's like a French proverb. Oh, part of it's missing out of my notes, I'm not gonna remember it. But there's a French proverb that basically says, um, uh, you can never, uh, you, uh, a door can only be open or closed. That's the translation. And um, Duchamp did not, just, just hated the idea. <laughs> that something could only be one way or the other, that, that, that things had to be binary. So in his studio, um, he took one door and he mounted it right at that door jam so that when you opened one side, you would shut it on the other side. So it was always open or closed at the same time, right? It was one door <laughs> and it was always open or closed. Um, in Norse mythology, this figure um, was personified as Loki. And one of my favorite old stories about Loki is um, there's this god Baldr, the god of the sun, and uh, uh, he is the most magnificent, charming, um, everybody loves him. This is him in the middle here. And uh, one day his mother, Frigg, has a dream that he will die. And she wakes up and she's absolutely horrified. So she goes out into the world and she makes everything in the world swear not to hurt him. So she gets an oath from every rock and every tree and every monster. You must not hurt my, do you swear not to hurt my son Baldur? And they all say, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so she comes back to um, Asgard and they have a big party because now Baldur's invulnerable, nothing can hurt him. So at this party, everybody's shooting arrows and throwing spears um, and everything's just bouncing off Baldur and not harming him at all. And then Loki, who is this um, uh, trickster figure who sort of half lives in the world of Asgard, um, is really annoyed by this because Baldur is like such, oh, he's got such an attitude and everybody loves him and that's so annoying. So this is Loki assuming the form of an old woman and Loki goes up to the blind god Hod and he says, Hod, why aren't you participating in the party? Why aren't you trying to kill Baldur? Um, and Hod says, well, I'm blind and you know, it would just be ridiculous if I tried to, tried to, I, I just don't want to participate. Um, and Loki says, um, Oh yeah, I should back up a second. So uh, in this guise, Loki goes to Baldur's mom and says, is it true that you've got everything in the world to swear not to hurt Baldur? And she says, yes. And Loki says, are you sure everything? Like, really? <laughs> and she says, well, I couldn't get Mistletoe to swear because, and I didn't, I didn't feel right asking Mistletoe to take the oath because Mistletoe is young and doesn't understand what an oath is, right? Mistletoe is an evergreen. Um, so Loki's like, aha. So he makes a dart out of Mistletoe. And he takes it to Hod, and he says, here, just throw this dart. And Hod um, says, okay, sure. And he throws the dart, and it pierces Baldur's heart and kills the invulnerable god of the sun um, and brings about Ragnarok, the, the end of the, the cyclical ending of the Norse myth cycle. Um, of course, nobody likes a killjoy, so this is what happened to Loki after that. Um, he was chained to a rock and uh, with his own brother's intestines, <laughs> and a serpent was suspended over his head, um, dripping venom into his face <laughs> until the uh, twilight of the gods, um, which is what this was. So, so Loki demonstrates that even the gods themselves, surrounding by seemingly impermeable walls, um, can fall. They can meet their end. Let this be a lesson to all of us. Um, the more impregnable you think a wall is, the more, the harder it's going to fall once it finally does come down, right? These things never last. And in comics, we have these, um, comics operates on the principle of panels. You take a box and you put it next to another box and there's this division between the boxes, much like that impermeable wall. We call it the gutter. Um, and comics, the, the kind of 
engine of comics is when the reader looks at one of these panels and absorbs the information and then crosses that border to get to the next panel. And it's in that crossing of the boundary and the connecting of the panels that comics kind of lives. This is a Nancy, this is an old Nancy comic strip from, from way back when. You may or may not find it funny. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so between the words and the pictures are the comics, and uh, people often talk in America about the history of comics being a little over 100 years old because The Yellow Kid was the first comic strip that was published, but of course the combination of words and pictures goes back much further than that. Um, this is um, The Gospel of Henry the Lion, um, an illuminated book from the 13th century, and this is an example of early comics where different figures are holding pieces of parchment, which is actually their lines of dialogue. They're actually speaking and they're holding this parchment. It's fascinating to look how early cartoonists tried to figure out how do we represent the spoken word? How do we, that, which again is this ephemeral thing. And the earliest examples are pieces of parchment holding words because of course there was the written word. So it makes sense that, you know, that's language, is the written form. Um, this is a letter um, from the Count de Mur of Holland, which illustrates his exploits around Europe. Um, and characters in this illustrated letter speak with uh, essentially word balloons. Um, the great English printmaker um, James Gilray employs a similar technique. So you can see parchment is kind of evolving into more of a kind of scrap of paper, perhaps, but it still has this kind of dimensional quality. And then later, it get, takes on a cloudy kind of quality as people try to wrestle with this idea of, of showing words. So spoken language becomes a thing that people wrestle with. And then also in comics, early comics, you see them um, trying to figure out how to show um, things that we can't see, things that we can't lay our hands on. Um, feelings becomes um, a, a concern. You look at this character's imagining, um, uh, sort of uh, expressing his love to his beloved in that central panel, and you see these lines radiating out from her head to show that she is... Um, you know, honored. And then he's miserable in that last, I guess, because they're far apart from each other. Uh, and of course, these emanating lines um, have a long history in religious iconography, going back to show the kind of holiness of a figure, to somehow show this ineffable, invisible quality um, that a person might have. Um, and uh, there are plenty of examples throughout art making. In this case, this is a George Gross drawing from the 20s where it's an artist in a studio trying to draw the live model, and he's getting really frustrated. And I can just imagine George Gross, George Gross making this drawing and imagining being that person, perhaps it was his own feeling that he had in this situation, and then just making those marks right in front of his head to get across that idea of frustration. Um, the placement of those marks matters. The fact that they're right here um, really adds to his emotional state. And then this is um, a woodcut by Edvard Munch, who you may know from The Scream, famous painting. However, <laughs> if you haven't looked at the rest of his work, you really should. He's an incredible expressionist artist. Um, and I uh, love this print um, because of the way it tries to capture what uh, kind of profound love uh, feels like between two people and uses the marks around those figures to somehow express or get at that. So in between those things, the abstract and the representational, um, that's where, that's where my area of interest is, and that's the stuff that I kind of drilled down to in my own work. Um, any comments about any of that? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own background, where I came from, and why I started on this crazy project. But does anybody have any? So, the, the political cartoon takes on special importance um, in the late 18th century, and the French Revolution is just filled with that. Of course, the, the Brits do it as well. Um, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a medium for an awful lot of cognitive nuance <laughs> there. Um, so I'm wondering um, the impact of the political cartoon, does it spill over um, into other forms of drawing? Uh, absolutely. Um, the thing, you're absolutely right. I mean, the political cartoon was um, available largely in newspapers. Um, sometimes there would actually just be sets of prints that you could buy, right? Posters. Um, 
uh, and one of the things that those cartoons did was it, br it summarized something succinctly, perhaps uh, simplistically in some cases, um, and it points to the fact that comics or or drawing in general um, lends itself to broad gestures, right? To stereotypes, to exaggeration, because when you boil something down to just a few lines in a drawing, it's very easy to like um, sort of go broad with that. Um, so I think that 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 aspect of comics is is something that you as one as a cartoonist has to kind of wrestle with and figure out how you're gonna how you're gonna handle it uh, i grew up in missoula montana um and in downtown missoula there's this combination magazine shop um magazine smoke shop where my dad would buy his pipe tobacco and every saturday morning i'd go down there with my allowance and he would drop me off um and i'd walk to the back of this shop across creaky wooden floors and um in the back corner basically looked like this this is just an internet image um this is not unfortunately a photo of my childhood but um this is what it felt like to go into this store um i would go in there and be surrounded by magazines and comic books and flop down on the floor and read for i don't know an hour an hour and a half while my dad was out running errands um the owners of the store were great they didn't bother you at all. They knew that you were trying to figure out what to do with that 50 cents and you wanted to make a good purchase. Um, so this was my early exposure to comics. And more often... 50 cents? Man, it was a dime. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, 50 cents, I could buy a few comics. Um, back in those days, more often than not, um, these are the kind of comics that I would come home with. Um, uh, when I was at see, the Bicentennial, I think I was nine years old in 1976. Uh, I would love like Captain America and all the, you know, all the characters that are now in um, cineplexes around the country would have blown my mind if I'd known that was going to happen one day. Um, and I also read Western comics. It was a, a, a strange irony that I was a kid growing up in Montana um, and I had a fantasy of being a cowboy. Um, uh, I loved those, these comics because apparently they're all about kids. <laughs> There's this feeling of like, oh, you could be an you could be an outlaw, you just and be a kid. Those things were okay because they're all kids, right? Two Gun Kid, Kid Cold Outlaw, and they were just absurd, over the top. I love the the this cover here that says action, action, action. Just being really clear about what you're in for. Um, very appealing to nine year old me. Um, yeah, I was very far from being a cowboy. I was the child of a French literature professor <laughs> at the University of Montana. Um, and in my dad's circle of friends, um, which were all university professors, uh, American comics like the ones I bought downtown were uh, looked down upon. They were considered trash. Um, in fact, at one point, uh, you may know that comics were called the marijuana of the nursery once upon a time. It's a lovely, lovely image of how they were poisoning the minds of today's youth. Uh, however, there were some comics that his colleagues did not turn their noses up at. Um, comics from Europe were okay <laughs> because they were from Europe. <laughs> if they are from Europe, they must be superior to American trash comics because um, they're beautifully drawn and they were written, in this case, written and drawn by a Belgian person named uh, Georges Remy or Hergé. Uh, a lot of those parents didn't, I think, fully process that Tintin spends a lot of his time chasing down opium gangs and getting into gunfights. More people get shot and killed in Tintin comics than in any mainstream American comics. So these comics were actually um, quite violent. Um, and of course, I read as many of them as I could lay my hands on, which was all of them at the time. Uh, so mainstream American comics, European comics. I was like... Um, soaking up as much as I could. I had to spend my allowance on the superhero stuff and my parents would actually buy me these, so that was a good deal. When I was about 10 years old, I drew a self-portrait imagining what I would be like as an adult. Jason Lutz, grown up. Um, apparently I got a diploma from Columbia Pictures because I'm pretty sure that's how that works. Um, <laughs> what's most interesting, my mom sent me this picture I think five or six years ago, just a package of old stuff she was going through. And what's incredible to me is that I'm imagining myself being a cartoonist. I'm working on the latest issue of Spider-Man right here. This is a page of original art. Um, you can see there's a memo from Marvel Comics who publishes Spider-Man, and it says, from Marvel Comics to Jason L., deadline June 3rd. So I've got a deadline. But on the calendar, it's June 8th. <laughs> so I've missed my deadline. And rent was due on June 1st. <laughs> I'm accepting donations. Um, 
So what was mind blowing about this to me is that either I predicted my future or I, by making this drawing, I somehow created my future because I would become a starving artist <laughs> who was always missing deadlines. Um, I also would get glasses when I turned 15, but I didn't, I didn't know right that. <laughs> I feel differently now, but at the time I would only eat, you know, at Thanksgiving, I was the person with all the brown food. And then it's up to Hobbit. Yeah, it's still up to Hobbit, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a chicken leg? Totally. Yeah, there is a chicken leg on the floor, or on the table. I, I don't think I see it behind that stack of comic books. Important right. food. Um, so it was interesting to see that I imagined myself being a cartoonist. Um, the other thing that happened in Missoula, Montana, and elsewhere in the world in 1977 was this. Um, some people call my generation Generation X, but I think we're the Star Wars generation because this movie had a profound and lasting effect on us. Um, the hegemony of Star Wars, um, for better or for worse, you know, you can say what you want about it, but it did uh, deeply impact a lot of people in my generation. And in the end, for me, I believe it was a very positive impact that it had on me. Um, and when I was looking back at my life and trying to figure out where, why I ended up where I'm at, um, I couldn't at first figure out what it was about this and how it applied to my work, because you don't really see any Star Wars in here. But um, eventually I did figure it out, and I'll get to that in a second. My parents got divorced around then, and my mom moved with my brother and my sister and I to a suburb of San Jose, California, which looked like this, which was um, just a big suburban development where all the houses looked alike. Um, my first day of fifth grade, I walked home into the wrong house. <laughs> And I didn't realize it until I opened the fridge and saw like leftover Chinese food. And I was like, I, didn't, I don't remember getting Chinese food. And then I realized that the kitchen table was different. And then I heard footsteps upstairs and I ran out of the house, which is to say I was lost in this place. In Montana, I was running around in the forests and hills. And here I was just one cookie cutter house after another. And I don't know what I would have done with myself if I hadn't discovered this. Um, the kind of, uh, did I hear a half clap? One or two D&D people in the audience. Talk about subversive. If you don't, <laughs> if you don't know what this is, um, this is the, the crazy invention of a couple of Midwesterners, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, um, who had this idea that you could sit down with a bunch of your friends and basically tell a story together. It's a collaborative storytelling game. Where one person is kind of the kind of host or narrator, and the other people are players, and um, this fell into my lap in fifth grade, I think, and every summer, every spare moment I had, my friends and I were playing this game. And what was amazing about this game was that it showed us that um, it put creativity in our hands. It said, this is a game that has some rules. <laughs> every once in a while, you'll roll some dice to see what happens, but really what's happening is you're making stuff up, you're improvising, and you're telling a story together. So this was like an incredible creative license for a kid who felt lost in the suburbs and all of his <laughs> nerd friends. Um, this is, again, an internet image, but I'm, I would have been a dead ringer for the kid in the dark blue shirt there, around age 14 or 15. But I deeply admire the man on the left because of his, he knows who he is with the rainbow suspenders and the, and the chin curtain in, which is to say he's a real life wizard as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so uh, Dungeons and Dragons had a huge impact on my kind of giving me confidence to tell a story improvisationally and to trust my instincts when it came to deciding what was going to happen next. I got out of high school, decided to put aside childish things and go be a real artist, stop drawing comics. I'd kind of been drawing comics here and there over my, through my teen years, so I, um, I, was, I applied to one art school, was lucky enough to get in, um, the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, um, and I was like, okay, no more comics for me. I'm gonna be a serious artist, a painter, or a filmmaker, or a performance artist, or something like that. Um, but luckily, within a couple years, I was disabused of that notion because I came across this book here. Um, Read Yourself Raw is a collection of stories from an anthology called Raw Magazine, which was published in the um, 80s and early 90s by Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly. Um, Art Spiegelman, you may know as the author of Mouse, which is, uh, um, I think it's the only graphic novel so far to win the Pulitzer Prize. An incredible accomplishment. Um, and what a lot of people don't know about art is that in addition to being um, this kind of pioneer of the art form, um, through, uh, through Raw Magazine, he and his wife Francoise 
showed a whole generation of American cartoonists what other kinds of comics were being made in the world. These were largely either obscure and unknown American cartoonists or European cartoonists. And they were not oriented around a genre. They were just each story on its own was an individual's expression of something they wanted to say. So to a young kid in art school, this was like kind of mind blowing. All of a sudden, I realized that comics were not confined to the world of science fiction and superheroes, which is a wonderful world, in, in which I partake heartily, <laughs> but that comics was just an art form. Um, and that may seem like old news at this point, but to me at this time, it was uh, a revelation. Uh, uh, so I started digging into other comics and I found the work of Chester Brown, a Canadian cartoonist. And in his work, I learned that if you take the words out of a comic and you have some silence, all of a sudden there's room for the reader to go in there and, and draw connections on their own. So he taught me the value of pauses and quietness in comics. I was saying earlier, when it comes to political cartooning, comics lends itself to these broad gestures. Um, and things like in superhero comics, you can, you know, you can draw buildings exploding um, relatively easily. It's just ink on paper, right? There's this, there's this temptation to just draw whatever you want and it's really fun. But sometimes restraint, when you, when you work against that, um, you can um, reap great kind of narrative benefits. Um, ben Catcher is a cartoonist who showed me that comics could be poetry. I won't go too much into depth um, on much more of these. I saw Wings of Desire when I was in high school. I mean, college. I didn't think about it until much later, but this put the idea of Berlin in my head. Um, I really hadn't thought about the city until this point at all. If you don't know this film, um, it's about angels that are wandering Berlin and they can listen in on people's thoughts. So, and that actually happens a lot in my book where you kind of just can um, uh, listen in on what people are thinking. And I think that I didn't do it consciously, but looking back, I realized that I think this film put that idea in my head. When I was thinking back about writers that affected me, the two big ones were Ursula Le Guin and William Faulkner. Ursula Le Guin uh, with very, very f kind of an economical language, with very few words, can just conjure incredible, incredible stuff. Like this book, of Wizard of the Sea, is quite thin, um, quite slim, I should say, but, um, but she somehow conjures up this entire rich, um, fantastical world. And I think she does that partly by leaving lots of um, she doesn't overexplain. She doesn't use a lot of adjectives, right? She allows the reader to kind of fill in the gaps. So and taught me that language can be spare and suggestive. Um, William Faulkner, um, I was reading this book out loud with my college girlfriend. Um, not recommended. It's not a great date book, as you can tell by the cover. <laughs> and we were switching off chapters, and I was my turn to read, and I was reading a chapter, a paragraph, and I lost track of the meaning of the words. I just started saying that, you know, the sounds just were coming out of my mouth, but I lost track of the, the significance. And I got a couple sentence in, sentences into it, and I just broke down and started crying. And I didn't understand why. I had no idea why. But there was something about the rhythm and the sound of the words themselves that made that happen. And then when I went back and read that paragraph, I realized that it was about, it was very appropriate that I would break down and cry. But Faulkner had done something with the specific word choice that created an emotional effect, much like music might have done. Which is to say, William Faulkner, real life wizard. Um, does anybody know who this woman is? Uh, winner of uh, best film editing in 1977. Uh, her name was Marsha Griffin before she married a guy named George Lucas. At this point in time, she's known as Marsha Lucas. They met at USC Film School in the editing suite, um, fell in love, and she went on to become one of the greatest film editors in Hollywood history. Uh, she edited American Graffiti. She edited Taxi Driver. Martin Scorsese was stoned out of his mind in New York City and could not finish this movie, and he called Marsha up and he said, come save my movie, <laughs> and she flew across the country and did the final edit on Taxi Driver, which is considered an American classic. She edited New York, New York, Alice doesn't live here anymore, Star Wars, A New Hope, Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and half of Return of the Jedi. If you're a Star Wars nerd, you know there's a good half and a bad half, <laughs> and Marsha edited the good half. She was a troubleshooter. Anytime Spielberg or Coppola or any of those California filmmakers had, a trouble, had trouble on their movie, they couldn't make something work, she would come in and she would edit the scene or the sequence and make it work. And everybody thought that she was the most gifted film editor of the time. Um, she got divorced from George Lucas halfway through Return of the Jedi. 
uh, she, while he was away filming in England, um, she was really lonely living on Skywalker Ranch, and there was a guy that they had hired to do all the stained glass, beautiful Art Nouveau stained glass, happens to have been my high school English teacher's pot dealer also. <laughs> they fell in love. Um, George came back. She said, I can't take this anymore. I fell in love with somebody else. They had a horrible, horrible, awful divorce. She probably got a really great settlement, but she never worked in film again. And there's speculation as to why that is and what the conditions of the settlement were. Um, I, uh, she's not in any of the Star Wars documentaries. She's been basically written out of film history with a couple of exceptions. She's mentioned in a couple of books. Um, but I just like to have her in this talk because I want people to recognize the contributions of Marsha Lucas. Film uh, editing was considered women's work because it was tedious and you cut things up and stitch them back together much like a seamstress. Um, a lot of people in the general public not understanding that the actual storytelling happens in the hands of the editor. The script, sure, you can write that, but how the images get spliced together is where the emotional content um, comes out. More I could tell you about her, but I won't. <laughs> Uh, I just want to recognize her contribution and the fact that her storytelling is the part of Star Wars that I took with me in the end. Um, David Lynch was a huge inspiration because he always trusts his gut no matter, no matter the commercial value. <laughs> he doesn't care if his film makes it or flops. Uh, he just always follows his deepest instincts and the results. You may like his work or not, um, but one thing that's amazing about them is he always stays true to what he believes is the right choice, not the commercially viable choice. Uh, I was living in Seattle, Washington after art school, uh, and this newspaper showed up um, called The Stranger. It was a free weekly paper. And I was invited by the art director to do a weekly comic strip for it because he knew that I liked making comics. So I looked back at my early inspirations, um, uh, specifically to Hergé, who drew Tintin, and learned that originally Tintin appeared in um, this magazine, this newspaper in Belgium. It was a weekly paper. Um, it was a collection of stuff for kids. It was called The Little 20th Century. Uh, and that Tintin originally was published two pages at a time uh, in this magazine. So, uh, and here I was given the opportunity to write a serialized story. So I, I took inspiration from um, one of the people that I had loved growing up. And I examined his work closely and figured out a lot of stuff about the nuts and bolts engineering of, of comics. For instance, I could, I mean, I could teach a whole class, of course, but in the lower right hand corner here, there's a big explosion. That's a cliffhanger. You have to get next week's paper to see the answer to it. Um, in a comic, you're dealing with page spreads. This is a unit of information. So whatever happens here is a really great opportunity to be suspenseful or to get people to wonder what's going to happen next because then they have to turn the page to find out. Every time you turn the page, you reveal a new page spread. So you never want to have a surprise happen over here. You want a surprise to be up here because it's all visual and it's right there. A reader will see the surprise ahead of time if you put it here because then they're going to go back here and read. So it's those kinds of things I learned from... Um, looking at Hergé closely. So with that in mind, I was living in this house in Seattle, and I had a dream about dancing with my girlfriend who I read as I lay dying with, <laughs> uh, and she melted through my hands like wax. So taking a cue from David Lynch um, and dream imagery and the value of it, I started with that image um, and then wrote one page a week for this newspaper over the course of two and a half years, making it up as I went along, trying to just trusting that this story was taking me somewhere. And that was kind of my self-education in comics, because at art school, people didn't know how to talk about comics. I had to figure it out for myself from looking at works that existed and then making them. Um, that eventually became this book, Jar of Fools, which was kind of my training wheels. After I was done with this book, I thought, OK, I'm a cartoonist. I get it. I know who I am as a cartoonist. I know what I'm capable of. And I could tell any kind of story I want to. What do you got, world? Uh, and that's when I found this book or more accurately, an ad for this book, which is a book of photographs of um, the time. And I read a little, just the paragraph of ad copy next to it, and there was one sentence that said, like, and the, and the, um, and the jazz bands played on while the world spun out of control. And I thought, that's it. That's what I want. I didn't know anything about Berlin in the 20s. Like, I'd seen maybe part of Cabaret once at a college party, but I knew nothing beyond that. I knew Three Penny Opera. I knew the music from Three Penny Opera. Um, so I knew I had to do some research. So I did about two and a half years of just reading, working, day, working my day job. Um, 
get found every book I could lay my hands on. This is before the internet, so I went to every library and used bookstore, found everything I could even vaguely related to the subject, with the only limitation being I didn't want to read anything about um, that happened after 1933, because one of my goals was to immerse myself to sort of time travel. Um, so my whole focus was on everything before um, 1933, for those of you who don't know, is when Hitler becomes chancellor. So I wanted all my focus to be on bef that time period before. Found this book by Alfred de Blin called Berlin Alexanderplatz, an amazing impressionistic novel of the time, which was invaluable. And over the course of those two years, I just started making notes and sketches about who my characters might be. I always started with a real world um, figure. In this case, this sketch on the left is the artist Katie Kolvitz, um, self-portrait, um, and then who was living and working at the time in Germany. And then I would redraw that and then put the original source image aside and then redraw the character until they be, felt like they were my character. So I'd either start with a drawing or a painting or photographs. These are two actual real people that did live then who became characters in my, in my book. And I made lists of high flutin ideas about things I wanted to have in there, like the realms of body, mind, and spirit. Uh, emotions like joy, fear, anger, envy, love, and sadness, those are going to be in there. <laughs> This is my outline for the content of my book. I was so excited about comics and the potential of comics that I was like, I'm going to show everything, like everything that humans are capable of. Um, luckily, these highfalutin ideas fell by the wayside once I got to know my characters and they sort of came alive for me on the page and I could just sort of pay attention to them. When I first sat down and start to, when I first start writing a story, um, I make these little diagrams called thumbnail drawings. Each one of these, in my case, is about an inch, just an inch high, each little drawing. And I'm working out the, um, the visuals on the page, trying to figure out what panels, what the panels are going to look like, where the figures are going to be within the panels, and then I have to, I write it all out, all the dialogue next to these, because I have to think about the words and the pictures together. Some people can just write a movie script and then translate that into comics, but in my case, in order to really understand how it's all going to work together, I have to sort of diagram it out. And then later, originally this book was published a chapter at a time. Each chapter was 24 pages long, and I would make an outline to just figure out what happens on each page. So this is pages 1 through 24, and there's just one little sentence saying what happens on that page. And then starting from that outline, I would go and then make these thumbnail drawings. So then I would take that outline and start to work out the scenes. Um, for each scene, I have to figure out what kind of visual reference I need. So in this case, I need some background stuff. I need, um, I go through all my books of photographs. This is before Google image search was a thing. I find, a, in this case, a phone booth that would have been on the street in 1930. Um, and then that finds its way into the background. Um, and in this other case, my very first visit to the city of Berlin, for real, I was 200 pages into the story before I actually visited the real place. And when I was there, I found this great book in a used bookstore of <laughs> streetcars of Berlin. Uh, and I found um, that streetcar, and the lower photograph is the streetcar that would have been on this corner in 1930. Was, that was the line. That was the street that it would have gone down. And there aren't many occasions when it, all of my research lines up perfectly, but this is one. And nobody knows that except now you guys <laughs> and me. That's what the rough pencils look like. That's, and then I clean them up, and then I ink on top of that. That's what the finish, finish inks look like. I wrote the first three chapters. Those were published as floppy comic books, and then I took a step back and looked at this was, uh, whereas before I made up my previous book one page at a time. In this case, it was one scene at a time, but with specific historical events that were going to create kind of um, milestones, the Bloody May demonstration and then the elections of 1930. And so after three chapters, I stepped back and I looked at all the characters that had kind of cropped up and I looked at the themes that had arisen and I just wanted to get all those things in my head before I stepped into the next phase of making the story. And then I wrote up through there. Those were collected into two books. Um, and then between those books, I moved to Vermont to teach at the Center for Cartoon Studies. It's a two-year MFA program, training the cartoonists of the future in beautiful White River Junction, Vermont. This is the, um, yeah, that's the, that's the place. This is the graduating class of, I think this is, this is probably 2008. Uh, and a great bunch of kids. Um, what was great about this year for me is over on the left here, that's Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly. Um, 
pro, you know, people who had a profound impact on my career as a cartoonist who um, came up that year. Francoise was the commencement speaker. So I got to thank them in person for sending me down this uh, particular path. Oh, there they are back in the day. So the last thing I'll show you is the final sequence of the second part of the book. Two characters are flying out of the city. Um, there's a radio voiceover. The German Communist Party did well with a gain of 23 seats. Um, a voiceover about the elections of 1930. That middle panel there, it says, as you can see, NSDAP in the Reichstag. The NSDAP is the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party. This is the year that they swept into the Reichstag. Um, so I had this little thumbnail sketch, and I was looking around for a photograph to use as reference, because I did not know what the inside of the Reichstag looked like. Um, and then I found this photograph, which is amazing. And the reason this is amazing, for me, as somebody who, for whom, obviously, I'm a visual storyteller, so images are incredibly important. You can see here, visually, what happened um, politically that year, because this swath of gray right here, that's everybody in their brown shirts. Those are the Nazis who've come in not to work within government, but to dismantle it. So an incredible photograph. <laughs> I'm not about tracing. You can learn a lot by tracing, as long as it doesn't look too much like the, you know, too slavishly like copying the original photograph. Um, but it can save you time. And when the original, when the final goal is this, you know, I think it's fine to trace. Um, so the greatest gain that year went to the National Socialists, who stunned observers by taking 95 seats in a landslide victory, raising their stake in the Reichstag from 12 to 107 in one fell swoop. Yeah, some heavy sighs in the audience. Um, so in the end, I was uh, 22 issues in 22 years. It took me to finish that book. Um, when I started it, I was 26 years old. My original calculation at the age of 26 was like, I think it'll take me 14 years. Like I, when I look back, I, I remember thinking that, and then thinking, and now I'm thinking, what were you thinking? <laughs> you were about to embark on a 14-year project. That's insane. And in the end, I missed that deadline by eight years. <laughs> Which is to say, I already knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I finished it the, a few days before my 50th birthday in 2017. The end. We have to sadly go, but I yes. have one quick question. Yeah. What was, is the reaction of Germans to this? I, of course, have been terrified on my visits over there. Who is this arrogant American who's telling us our own history? It's in translation there, and, the, and it's done very well. It's in like a fifth printing. Oh, I think they love it. They, the people who come to my talks do appreciate it very much. And the thing that I realized after going was that they were, they're just grateful that somebody has paid attention to their history and wants to tell that story. So I feel really lucky about that. Is a selection of color, black and white, um, purposeful, it felt good, was it an effective relation to it, or was it more cerebral? Um, most of my stuff has like, it, it comes from an intuitive place, and then later I apply or I re-examine or analyze what I did. And it's, a, you know, as you can see, I'm kind of like, I have almost an engineer's approach to the drawing, right? It's like iteration and refinement, but the initial, the initial impulse is always the thing that I follow up on. I'm gonna write this story about Berlin in the 20s. I don't know anything about it, I'm gonna do it. It's gonna take me 14 years, crazy. Um, the black and white part partly was due to economics. It was more expensive to publish in color. Um, it was also this feeling of like, if it's black and white, it'll feel more historical, right? Like a black and white film. Um, but but really, deeper than that is my feeling as a cartoonist is that when it's just, when I make this art, it's just ink on paper, black ink on white paper, and then it gets sent to the printer and it gets printed and you receive in this book, black ink on white paper. Um, there's no color process that's like breaking the color up into different layers and then reassembling them. So this is like the most direct connection that I have to the reader. Like it's a, there's very few steps between me and the reader and I like that intimacy. I also feel like when the page itself is white and the gutters are white and the panels are white, they all can feel more like of a piece together. If these were all color, then they would separate out. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought up their day. I grew up on all those. And 
the thing with those, and this is why I like your book too, is there's a lot of historical facts. Yes. I mean, when you read the Tan Tan books, you knew everything about a country. Yeah, yeah, he really did his homework. He really yeah. did his homework. Or his team did his, in the later books, he would send out his people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 yeah, right. He learned a little bit about racial stereotyping later in his career, but um, but yeah, he did, a lot of that stuff was very carefully. Which is, which is why it's very readable. Yes. And as kids, we learned a lot of stuff. Yep, absolutely. And the readability was really something. Like, he was doing, he was creating this, it's like, those books, there's like a little engine that turns the pages for you. It's so easy to read those books. What's your next 14 year project? Yeah. I think it's going to take me two and a half years. I figured out how to draw smaller and simpler. That's going to be a western that takes place in Arizona in 1865. A kid. <laughs> there is a kid, but she's a 16 year old Mexican girl. She's the main character. And um, I don't have to draw any buildings because it's in the desert. In fact, Phoenix, Arizona was just three tents on a river at this point in history. But I do have to learn how to draw horses, which is. Big, big challenge. What's that? And cacti. And cacti, yes. You have to go in a cave. Have to go, <laughs> go in a cave. And, and will it, do you foresee it having the heftiness? Of no, no, no. It'll be probably 120 pages, and it'll be color, because I want to play around with that and see how that feels. And using color to convey the natural landscape is really something I'm interested in. And, you know, um, so it's, slightly, it's a little bit more experimental and fun, because it's action adventure. But of course, it's also got a you know, it was a pretty crazy and interesting time, that period of history in, in, in that part of the world. I just want you to know, don't take this too hard. I lost my graphic novel virginity reading books. <laughs> I'm <PMI>. grateful. <laughs> Thank you for giving it a try. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you.